Okay, we have a lot to cover today. We are starting a new series, a series on Pesach. And what I want to do is really follow the style that we've been following over the Chumash classes and to try and figure out a bit of an analysis, which ultimately will hopefully lead us to a little bit of a deeper understanding of what Pesach is all about. But in order to get there, we have to go in a deep dive. <clears throat> and we're not going to cover the whole, um, you know, all the answers today. What we will attempt to do is to cover some of the questions. The thing is, Pesach night is full of questions. We're going to try and do four questions. The fourth question will be divided into four questions in itself. And then we'll see where we go from there. So we'll see how much time we have and how much we can cover. And Bezrat Hashem will continue next week um, and seeing how much time it takes us to cover to get to the answer we want to get to. Okay, so... Share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right, so we have a fascinating night ahead of us. We have the mitzvah of Lela Seder, which is, according to the Pew Report, more people sit down for the night of Pesach to eat matzah together around the table um, than people that come to synagogue on Yom Kippur. So we know how important the Seder night is. And the obvious question is, what is the central theme of Seder night? What is the obligation? And what are we supposed to take home? So we try and figure out what Pesach is. We, try, we have to analyze what exactly is going on um, at the Seder table. So the mitzvah ultimately in the Torah, which is written, begins with the following pasuk. Pasuk in Shemot, Yud Gimel Chet, Exodus 13, 8. Pasuk says, Vehigadeta levincha vayom hahu lemor. You have an obligation. You shall explain to your child on that day. Ba'avur zeh asa Adonai li v'tzeti mitzvah. It is because of what Hashem did for me when I went to Egypt. So there seems to be a very explicit um, obligation, which we all know is called the Hidalta And you should explain to your child. In the literal meaning, you should explain to your child. Now, the obvious question is, what happens if a person is sitting in a seder alone at home? or sitting in the set there with other people around the table, not necessarily with the children. Um, what happens if you've got a bunch of rabbis around the table? What do they talk about? And these are all questions which are discussed in the Mishnah. Before I want to talk about the Mishnah, the obvious question is, what is Be'igad Talimcha? The Pasuk just says, just say, just say that it's because of what Hashem did for me, I went free from Egypt. So if I say, say the night, I think very many people will be very happy with me. If I say, you know what say the night is? Four cups of wine, piece of matzah, piece of maror, a meal, and all you have to do for that is one thing. Does he feel his obligation? Well, there wouldn't be a Haggadah, the stick if we would cover it that way. So what exactly is the obligation? How are you supposed to go ahead and rip, um, reminisce this world? How are you supposed to say with the story? So in previous years, I've, I've discussed um, the famous Chaim Briska 
as to what the difference between the night of Pesach is about reminding ourselves that we came out of Egypt versus any other night of the year, every night of the year. We say in Kriyat Shema about how God took us out of Israel. So what is the difference? Why, what's so special about the night of Pesach? That is a, a whole separate discussion. But one of the most basic intrinsic pieces of the seven night is that there's an obligation not only to say it as we state it the rest of the year, but it's got to be done in a certain format. That format looks like Vehigal Talabincha. It seems to be your transmitting the story for generations, two generations. Not only that, the Gemara says, it's got to be done you've got to have a question and then you give an answer. Any teacher um, who's done some teaching will tell you that the best way to bring out a student's understanding is by either getting the student to ask a question or presenting a question to the student. That way the person will be able to distill, to internalize the message what's going on. And on Pesach, let us say there, there's a very specific obligation to be able to talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim, not just in whatever format you want, but specifically in the format of She'ela and Shuvah, of question and answer. What's the opening questions? Manishtana. All questions. So, I'm just going to mention the Mishnah. The, the Gemara Pesachim, the 116a, says the Mishnah. Mazgulo Kotsini, source number two. So they would pour the second cup. Yeah, part of the obligation on Saturday night is not only to um, seal like royalty, but actually act like royalty. The king doesn't pour himself his own cup of wine, and therefore we're all kings and queens. We all have to get the wine poured for us, and that's the custom. That's the halacha. We get somebody else to pour for us. So pour for him a second cup. Says the Mishnah, the Khan Haben Choel. And here the son begins to ask Aviv his father. So the son asks the father. Now, Bim En Data Ben, if the son is not uh, intelligent enough to ask the questions, he doesn't have the capacity, he's too young, he's, uh, uh, he's not intellectual enough, whatever it is. Aviv Menamdo, the father teaches him. What does he say? Manishtana halayla zemikolilo. Famous question, why is this night different from all other nights? Okay, that's pretty much the breakdown of the mission. The Gemara, the mission carries on, and the Gemara starts as follows. Tan Rabbanan, Rabbi learned. Chacham, if the child is a Chacham, the son, the son actually asks. We may know Chacham, and if he's not a Chacham, if he's not able to know the capacity to ask, he's so short His wife asks him the questions. Because always got to be in a question and answer format. Beam laugh. What happens if he's sitting alone in the, who knows where? Beam laugh. Who shall I like more? He asks himself a question because what's so important for the night of Pesach is not only to speak out, about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, about when we came out of Egypt, but also the way it's expressed through a format of question and answer. And even if there's nobody around, you say the question and answer to yourself. Yeah, last year, two years ago, when people, many people were unfortunately alone, which is not usual for Pesach, the halacha would be you would actually read the Haggadah to yourself. Speak it out. Ask the question, Manishana, give the answer to Mahidi. Okay, well, finish the time of the Chamin. Pesach. Shonim said, I said, if you got two great rabbis who know my Ishtana backwards back to front in multiple languages, multiple different meanings to every question, nevertheless, they ask it in that format. Man Ishtana, Halayla Zenikale. So, question number one is, which we're going to uh, pose, is the obligation of the Higad Kalimcha to speak it out. 
How are you supposed to do it? Seems to be from the Mishnah. The way you're supposed to do it is specifically through a certain format of question and answer. Okay, question number two. When are you supposed to do this? When are you supposed to speak out? See, yeah, that's right. So you're looking at me and you're thinking to yourself, this guy just fallen out from the moon. And the reason why I ask it is because in the Haggadah itself, we actually talk about this question. So we look in the Haggadah. We say the following passage. Yachol Merosh Chodesh. I would have thought they would actually read out the Haggadah from Rosh Chodesh. Why would you think that? Okay. Talmud Lomar Bayomahu. Comes along with Pasuk to say Bayomahu on that day. So the Gemara, on that day, what's that day? Today, the 14th of Nisan. Says the Gemara, I bayomahu yachon bodyom, means the day we bring the Koran Pesach. I bayomahu yachon bodyom. I would have thought it's, it could be the entire day of the 14th. Does it have to be specifically the night of the 14th or ultimately the night of the 15th, which is the night of Pesach? Talmud lomar ba'avu zeh, ba'avu zeh lo amarti lebishav shish matzor, matzal marom nechim panech. It says specifically, Ba'avur Zeh, for the sake of this, what's this? The time when you have Matzah or Maror in front of you. It means ultimately the time we're supposed to say the Haggadah and speak out the Yisiyad Mitzrayim is specifically on the 19th of the 15th. But from the mere question of the Baal Haggadah, the mere question which is posed by the and Shnei Knesset Agadola, the members of the Great Assembly who actually established the text what we have of the Haggadah today, but there were parts added later, but ultimately the overall text was like the Sidur, which we have for Tvila, was established by the members of the Great Assembly. And they pose this question, that I would have thought that you would be sitting around your Seder table right now, a month before Pesach. And Bagada says, no, no, no. Actually, it's gonna be on that day. So on that day, I would have thought maybe I'd have it in the morning. The morning of Erev Pesa. So no, 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 you have to have it in the night, especially when you have Matzah Maror in front of you. So the obvious question is, when exactly are you supposed to do it? Well, we know, we, we say in Haggadah, you're supposed to do it when you have the Matzah Maror in front of you. But what is going on over here? Why should you think there should be any other time? Now, we mentioned before that there is an obligation every night to mention Tiat Mitzrayim. So what's unique about this? And then why, why say out the Haggadah in this format where we said a question and answer, specifically when we have Matzal Maror on the table, what is going on over here? There must be something much deeper, which we are perhaps missing over here. Question number three. What are we supposed to talk about? Any suggestions? What are we supposed to discuss for Yitzhak Mitzrayim? There's an obligation to speak it out, but what are we supposed to talk about? Anyone want to attempt? Well, I, I don't know what, about the supposed to, but I know what, what we do, if I stop to think about it. I mean, we recount the plagues, for one thing. Um, so we're telling the story of the night uh, after we get through the plagues. And so cool. the story of the lead, lead up to and the departure from Egypt. Excellent. So it sounds very, you know, like you correctly said, we, we all know what we do. We recount the story. But the story of what well, story of the Exodus. So why am I suggesting otherwise? So the question is maybe what part, if we're supposed to say over the story, 
is there a specific part? Josh mentioned, you know, you have to mention 10 plagues, uh, perhaps the coming out of Egypt, which is, you know, a critical piece. But perhaps there's another piece over here. And, I, and again, if we use our Haggadah as a bit of a outline, it might help us. I guess it is as follows. So we all know there's four sons. The recurring theme of number four, is something which we happens throughout the Haggadah. We have four cups of wine. We have four sons. We have four questions in the Manishtana. We have four questions in today's class. So the Chacham, um, the first question, which is asked by the wise son. Let's try and analyze what his question is. Chacham Mahu Omer. The wise son, what does he say? What are these testimonies, statutes, judgments that the Lord our God commanded? So the Chacham is pointing to the different customs of the night. And what he's saying, what's all this about? It's interesting to know that the Rasha also had a very similar question. But that is not quite what we uh, kind of go with. Um, we have a very different answer between the Chacham and the Rasha. But the Pasuk in Devarim is exactly this question. So it's very interesting. The, the question which is posed by the Chacham, it says Devarim, Deuteronomy 6.20. The question which is posed is, what is all this all about? And the answer which we give him, if you look at the Pasuk, is really the answer we give him. So there are certain parts of the Haggadah which is very critical. You know, Manishtana always is one of them, because you have to ask question and answer. There is the answer in a short format, which is, we were once slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh in Egypt. Lord, that God took us out from there with a strong hand. Now trust on. If God wouldn't have taken us out, taken us out of Egypt, we would have all still been there. And if we even were all uh, sages, discerning, all elders, knowledgeable of Torah, mitzvah, it's a mitzvah. To tell her the story of his exodus from Egypt. And anyone who actually spends time telling over the story of Egypt is praiseworthy. That is pretty much the Haggadah in a nutshell. Then you have Rabbi Leza Omer, Kosh Hosha, Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel says, Kol Mishla Mashlasha Dwarim Elo Pesach. Maybe he doesn't say these three things. Doesn't fit his obligation. Pesach, Matzah, Maror. In fact, if somebody, for whatever reason, can't, um, you know, speak out the entire Haggadah, doesn't have the luxury to just talk about the Divrei Torah and to go through the Haggadah, each piece one by one, trying to understand it, just to know what he, he or she can, has to say, the minimal part. Manishtana, Avadim Hayinu, which is the answer. Question the answer. And these three things, Pesach, Matzah, Maror, and what each one symbolizes. All right. If you look at the question of the Chacham, he seems to be asking about rituals. And in the Pasuk, what do we say? What does the Pasuk answer him? Which is the answer we gave him? That we were slaves to a Pharaoh in Egypt, and God took us out. So far, so good. It's about fascinating. 
Okay, here's the catch. If you look at the Haggadah inside, the Haggadah actually doesn't say this answer. So we look inside. Chacham Ha'omer, Chacham, what does he say? Ma ha'edot v'achukim v'shutim 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 what are the assessment statutes and judgments of the Lord that God commands you? Now here's the answer. Accordingly, you will say to him, ask for the Lord of Pesach. You should know that one halacha, we may not eat nafi koman, can't eat the dessert after the food of the, basically after you finish eating. After you finish Korban Pesach, don't eat anything else. We have this custom that now we eat the Afi Koman to remind ourselves about the Koran Pesach. And we don't want to eat anything after the final matzah other than the two cups of wine, which we have as part of the obligation, but we eat nothing else to remind us of this halakha. En maftirin achara Pesach Afi Koman of dessert. What was dessert back in the day? Koran Pesach. No ice cream, no fruit, no sorbet. You ate a meal, Korban Khadiga, which was a meat meal, and then you would eat the Korban Pesach. You obviously wouldn't eat too much meat for the original uh, main course. But dessert was Korban Pesach, the Paschal lamb. And after you don't eat. That is such an important halakha that when the son asks all these questions, what's going on tonight? And you want to kind of transmit tradition from generation to generation, you know what the halakha is telling? Which is kind of wild because First of all, this is not what the Pasuk says. We know what the Pasuk says. The Pasuk is actually in two places. The Pasuk is the one in Devarim. She said, Abadim Ayinu. And the other Pasuk is a Pasuk in Shemot. It says, Vayat shalcha b'lcha machar lemor. Mazot. When a time comes, a child asks you, what's going on? You tell him, the mighty and the Shem brothers are out from Egypt, the house of bondage. The first question is, why are you actually saying something different to what the Torah tells us to tell the child? And the second question is, what's one got to do with anything? What, what's going to do with... Uh, the, the child asks almost like a halachic question, and the answer, which is the response, seems to be, in the Torah, a practical answer, or maybe a a, a uh, theological answer, you try and whatever that means. And in the Haggadah, it's also just a very practical, plain, cold discussion about a almost random halakha about not eating anything after the Quran Pesach. Something, something, something seems to be off over here. Something seems to be missing, which um, the, the Haggadah is telling us. And the question is, what's going on? Does anyone want to attempt to answer why, what's going on over here? Why does the Haggadah tell us one thing and we do something else? And what's the significance of En Maftir Nacha Pesach command? The guy's asking what's going on. It's like, you know, can you imagine someone comes to synagogue and asks, uh, well, what's all this filah all about? So yeah, you should know that uh, during uh, services, uh, especially during Kriyat Torah, you mustn't talk. I'm trying to figure out what's going on over here. What is going on? Josh, you look like you, you've got something to enlighten us with. <laughs> it's amazing because, you know, we read the Haggadah every year, and we say it year after year, and you look, this is not like some midrash, you know, a random idea. This is the Haggadah itself. And yet the Haggadah is not speaking out what the Torah is saying, and it almost says something which is almost insignificant. It's just almost mind-boggling. <laughs> okay. That was three questions. I've got one more question I want to share with you. So, if you tell me that we have an obligation to speak out 
the um, mitzvah of Yitziat Mitzrayim, seemingly Yitziat Mitzrayim is a story which happened. Now, a story has a beginning and has an end. So I will tell you there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. How much time you spend on the beginning, how much time you spend on the end, and how much time in the middle is what's going to make you successful, a good storyteller or not. But what is the beginning which we are talking about? So what are the options? Well, when did you tell the try and really start? What? We know we have to start Matchil Bignot and Misayim B'Shevach. You have to start from the very beginning. We start Mitchila, Yov, Teno, Ovea, Vodadara. You know, Arami, Oved, Avi, Ayad, Mitzrayma. There's one piece. So it seems to be like a quite early on. Another possibility is perhaps the Brit Ben Abitarim. So the covenant between God and, and Abraham, where God promises him, you should know your children will actually go into exile for 400 years. Um, the obvious question is, 400 years, the Jews were only there for 210 years. And Tosa asks this question, and you know, there's, there's many answers given. I think Tosa gets three, if I remember correctly. Um, one of the answers is, 400 years began from the Brit Benavitari, from this covenant between Abraham and God, then the countdown begins. Uh, another answer is, uh, yeah, from the time you track first, the other answer is, the uh, 210 years was it condensed in terms of uh, cruelty. So it was, they kind of got a, a short time in Egypt, so 40 has got the time off. Um, yeah. Another answer is that, that you're right, it was supposed to be 400, but they got off because uh, they couldn't cope. We know that as the Jews were in Egypt, it was going to be so difficult for them to handle the, the uh, uh, spiritual disaster which was happening in Egypt at the time was so bad that the, as we talk about uh, the Shah Nun, they were going to enter the 50th level of Tuma, whatever that means. And so God had to take them out quickly. Um, and that's what we do every day after Pesach. Surat Omer, we count 49 days. Well, the 50th day is going to be Shavuot, we're going to receive the Torah, which is the exact opposite of that. We're working out of every day, we're working out a way up the ladder. One, two, three, to attain spiritual light to kind of get away from the uh, negative, uh, impure places where in Israel were. But that is seemingly an emergency situation. But perhaps the beginning of Yitzhak Mitzrayim is already from there, from Brit Ben Avatarim, from the covenant between uh, God and Abraham, the Ramavino. Okay, another suggestion is perhaps from Bria Taulam, from the very beginning of creation. Why should that be? Well, if you ever learned Rashi before, the very first Rashi in the Torah says Bereshit in the beginning. Rashi says, Rashi quotes from his father, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. A discussion why he wants to open up his uh, magnum opus with a quote from his dad. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. Lo haya tarikh la atkhir ta Torah ela meachodesh haze lachem. Shim itzal shon ha'ashim ktabu ba Yisrael. The Torah should have really began with the first mitzvah. What's all this about? Talking about the creation. Go the long way around. Torah should have been cut into, you know, a whole fifth of the Torah should have been cut out. To tell us about, you know, the mitzvah of of um, which is the first mitzvah in the Torah. So Rashi brings a, a whole explanation. 
is a, a separate discussion. But another thing which Rashi brings is because Bereshit, Bishvil HaTorah Shri Prarashit, or Bishvil Yisrael Shri Prarashit. That the reason why Torah starts off with Bereshit in the beginning, because you should know who are the Rashit, the beginning. The beginning is for the entire world is created for the Jewish people. And the entire world is created for the Jewish people to go through Mitzrayim, to come out of Egypt and stand Tavzu and Tavahim and Arada, to stand by the foot of the mountain and receive the Torah. So if I ask you, if I want to kind of put Egypt or the entire story of the Exodus into a nutshell, what's the beginning? Perhaps the very beginning is the creation of the world. So maybe I should start there. So let's open up the Haggadah. Bereshit, Barah, Elohim, the Shemayim, the Aretz. It'll be all night. So that's another suggestion. Okay, so that's the opening questions. Where do we start the story? Let's maybe have a look at when does Isiyah Mitzrayim finish? So we're not quite sure where it begins. But where does it finish? We know where the beginning is and where the end is, but you will know, skewer out all the middle. But where's the end? <laughs> where does your fiat me try and finish? Any suggestion? So, Josh, you mentioned before there is 10 plagues. Okay. The culmination of it's at the trying. What would you suggest? Is it, you know, there's so many moving parts of this. Any ideas? We could say leaving that night, crossing the sea. We could say Har Sinai, and and given how far back you went the other way, I suppose we could keep coming forward to, to today. We we do. I mean, we're doing it at the table, and we're wow, we're, wow. Okay, pretty much. You you missed that one. You got one more option. I would I would maybe throw in there. I'll tell you what I got it from. Anyone anyone got us uh, with another piece? You said. Uh, from uh, you said uh, when they came out of Egypt, you said um, Matan Torah. You said you said sorry. You said Kriyat Yamsuf. You said Matan Torah. And there's another piece. What happens after Matan Torah, which is a major, you know, event in Klal Yisrael? Uh, entering the land. Oh, okay. Entering the land. Building the temple. Building the temple. In fact, in Dayenu, what do we say? We say, you know, Ilu this, Ilu that. If God were taking us out and this, you know, it's amazing. If you look through the this, this, this story, if God were just, uh, you know, taking us to the sea and not crossed it, and we wouldn't have crossed it, it would be in Dayenu, it would be good enough. And if he would have fed us the, the man and not taken us to, to uh, uh, not giving us Shabbat, it was enough. If we would have brought us to Hashanah and not given us the Torah, it's enough. If we would have given us the Torah and not given, taking us into Eretz Israel, you said it. And we've got it right over here. And then the last one, if we would have taken us to Israel and not built the Bet Midash for us, stay in also. So we have all these multiple different stages. And the obvious question is we're ready here all night trying to discuss. What's happened from Bereshit? I mean, this is going to take us a week. So maybe there's your answer. Like, you know, we've got to kind of condense it. But we have to understand what is the beginning and what is the end to be able to say over the story. Coming back to the original question. What is the obligation? The obligation is, we said, source number one, you have to say it over that this is what God did to me when he take, took us out of Egypt, did to us when he took us out of Egypt. Okay? We said it's got to be done in a format of a question and answer. Okay. What is going to be the, 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 uh, when you're supposed to do it? We said we're going to do it on the night of Pesach. Okay. Why we thought we should have done it perhaps earlier or the earlier day? We have to try and figure out. What are we supposed to discuss? We had two options. The Chacham talks about some, rit, you know, just the ritual part of the Seder. And in the answer of the Chacham, we talk about the Halacha of Afikoman. 
yet we know that really Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim is the actual story of the Exodus. So if we're relating a story, we're trying to figure out what is the beginning, what is the end? Is the beginning from Brit Ben Abitarim, covenant? Is it from even further back from Briat Olam, from the creation of the universe? And what's the end? When did we actually come out? We know when we came out. The question is, what defines the end? Is it the moment where we came out, literally? When we come out running out with our matzahs and, and the matzah couldn't be baked? Or is it later on, seven days later, when the sea was divided and they're finally, even from a psychological level, the Jewish people finally can sigh, you know, uh, give a sigh of relief. The Egyptians are not going to come running after us anymore. Or is it once they come out, come to Har Sinai, which is the whole reason why they come out of Egypt. As God tells Moses, tells Moshe Rabbeinu, the whole reason why I want you to take them out, because on this very mountain, where you're standing in front of me, says God to Moses, without your shoes, by the burning bush, which was on Har Sinai, you will come after the Mitzrayim and all the Jewish people will receive the Torah on this very mountain. Maybe that's the end. Or maybe it's when they go to Eretz Israel, which was the whole reason where they plan, the, you know, plan A before the Jews messed up between the Egel and the um, between the Egel, the golden calf, and the Miraglim, and the uh, spies, you know, but really, we were supposed to go into Eretz Israel? So perhaps that's the end of the story. Or perhaps, as we say in Dayenu, that, you know, it's no point in just going to Eretz Israel, but you want to have Beta Bechira, a place for God's presence to be able to actually rest. Maybe that's the end of the story with Seattle Mitzrayim. What is the beginning and what is the end? It seems to be never ending. <laughs> if it's never ending, how much time are we supposed to spend on this? And let's also just rewind back a little. The Gata Levincha seems to be Levincha. There seems to be some sort of transmission for generations. And what happens if you're sitting alone? Without children, without a wife, without other people around the table? Well, perhaps a child within us. Perhaps there is a message, not perhaps, for sure. The obligation of the Gadarincha is to get some clarity for ourselves. Once a year, this is not the same mitzvah which we have every night to remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim. There is something special about the night of the Seder that we need to hit home. And we need to hit a home run. We need to know what that story is. And if we don't get that story right, then we've missed the boat. And what we see in Haggadah seems to be such a, you know, broad spectrum. We're trying to figure out some clarity over here. What is it? What are we really painting? What picture are we painting over here? And what is the message deep down? I just want to mention um, Josh suggested Binyam Bet Midash, right? And maybe the end goal was when we go to Israel and we end into the Bet Midash. We have a, a temple, which is what we say in Dayenu. Ilu, um, if only God would have uh, taken us into Israel, Israel, would be good enough if we would just come to Israel without Bet Bichar. But not only that, He also gave us a Bet Bichar. It's amazing how we we count the Tovot of Kadosh Baruch Hu. We count every, we cherish every moment and every stage, and we appreciate. It's not just this, but if we would have just had this, all the more so. And we say with COVID, COVID really taught us that every single thing we shouldn't be taken for granted. If we can just breathe in this world, Dayen. If we can not only breathe, but also see, Dayen. If we can not only breathe, but also see 
and be able to smell, dayenu. If it's not only smelling, but also to be able to eat, dayenu. And so on and so forth. It's just incredible, the, the appreciation of every stage in our lives is clearly something the Haggadah is trying to you know, highlight for us. But that's a separate discussion. What I do want to just point out is that you know we have what is known as Arba Lishonot Shal Geula. There are four um, expressions of freedom. And we talk about it in Haggadah. It's mentioned in the Pasuk in Pashat Ba'era. Vehotseti. And I took you out. Vehitsalti. And I saved you. Vega'alti, another form of freedom. Velakati, and I took you out. Again, another type of different, four different expressions, which all mean the same thing ultimately. God took us out of Egypt. But there's a fifth expression. And those four expressions are what we mentioned. Multiple, the four, the whole night of Pesach is the four cups of wine, the four sons, the four questions of Manishtana. These are multiple of four because of the expressions of the four um, uh, expressions of Geula. But there's one more in the Pasuk. Veheveti, and I'll bring you to the land. And many people have the custom to fill up a Koshel Yaunavi, the fifth cup. The cup which is not drunk by us, which will be drunk, as Josh said, it's not, maybe the story hasn't ended. Maybe the story will end, or we are actively part of this story, which is fascinating, because it kind of brings everything together. When we talk about a person has to, a person has to look and visualize himself as if he himself came out of Egypt. I came out of Egypt? Egypt was 3,334 years ago we came out of Egypt. What does that mean? Coming out of the bondage of Egypt, the, the spiritual realm of what Egypt is. So again, separate discussion, but what we need for this, for, the, for what I want to say for this idea, is the Heveti, one of the expressions of Geulah, the fifth one, is symbolized by Elianavi not yet coming. We're praying for Elianavi to come and take us there. Israel, brother, but Midash, Mashiach will come. Seems to be the end goal. So maybe there's four expressions which are all the story which we have of the actual Exodus per se, but there's the fifth one which is actively still happening. So I'm going to perhaps leave you off with, I asked you four questions. The fourth question was, um, had four questions. And then maybe we just spoke about the fifth cup. I'll just leave you with one more question. And perhaps we'll continue next week to get a little bit of clarity. Today is question day. And there's Hashem next week, maybe we'll have some, begin some answers or a couple more questions, we'll see. So we know that on the Seder night, besides for just telling over the story for generations, and clearly, as I mentioned before, the story is still happening because, you know, I mentioned the Pew Report, more people have Seder night than Yom Kippur, and, and guess what? It's not just because of the matter, right? I mean, you can like matter, or you cannot like matter. You may like matter, your stomach doesn't like matter, whatever way, whatever way you want to put it. But ultimately, there's something which has been keeping us throughout generations, whether it's through times of trials and tribulations, through persecution, in, uh, you know, in the Spanish Inquisition, people were more so nefesh, you know, really put their neck out to have a Seder. People in Nazi Germany, people in the camps, so many stories of Throughout generations, we were able to transmit something, this story. One of the ways to do that is not only the actual story, but we all know there's an obligation to do it in a certain format. What is that format? So when you eat your matzo or drink your four cups of wine, it's got to be done. There's an obligation to leave. 
lean, the lean on the left side. And the question is, why do you lean? And obviously you lean because the leaning is supposed to be an expression of cherut. You mentioned before when the, the when pouring wine, it's not you're pouring wine to yourself. We're kings and queens, princes and princesses. So it's not about uh, just merely an expression of freedom, but a physical manifestation of freedom. How do you do that with halachic um, um, repercussions, whereby other people pour you the wine, you don't pour it yourself. And the other one is, we're actually going to physically lean because that is an expression of chirut, of freedom. Now, what happens if Chachamim, Chazal would have told us, you know what, expression of freedom is by sitting on nice big red cushions. Seemingly, who do the same? The question is, why is leaning an expression of freedom? So I don't know about you, but every um, Pesach comes around and I'm trying to lean, it's highly uncomfortable. And I only do it because supposedly freedom means an expression of freedom is by leaning. But guess what? The second I don't have to lean, I don't lean. When I'm eating Shulchan Orech, all the delicious food you have with Chod Yom Tov, I'm not leaning. I'm upright. I'm sitting on a chair like a man. So, granted, back in the day, classic answer is, yeah, back in the day, you used to sleep on couches, lie on, recline, which is lean. Lean is really the wrong word. Recline on the couch is, uh, was the way of Melachim, was the way of, uh, of uh, aristocrats. But the question is if that's true. You look historically, it was only the very um, uh, high echelons of society which would do that. But you would think when Chachamim would want to express Cherut, this concept of freedom, they would want to express it for everyone in a way which kind of gives us something which we can hang on to. But for us to do this cherut in a way which is so uncomfortable, it almost seems like a little bit strange why Chachamim would do such a thing and give us this format to actually bring out uh, freedom. So we're living the story, we're saying over the story, and the way we say over the story is in a format which is having the four cups of wine, having the matzah, having maror, different points, parts of the seder, and we're doing it and we're leaving. Why? Freedom. We came out of Egypt. However, whatever the end of the story is, we still have to try and figure it out. But we're, you know, we're living the dream. We're living this format of freedom. All right. Could we do something a little bit more comfortable? What is going on? What is Chachamim trying to bring out? If you lean, if you recline, this is kind of going to really get the message home. It's not just the story. It's the way we actually physically do it. There must be a much deeper message going on over here. So we're left with quite a few questions. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop here. I'll just recap the, all the questions that you shouldn't forget that you have some time to, to uh, uh, think about over the next week or so. And Mr. Hashem will continue next week. So just very quickly, what is the story? How are you supposed to do it? When are you supposed to do it? We spoke about question and answer. When are you supposed to do it? The Haggadah says, Yachom Rosh Chodesh. Um, what are we supposed to talk about? The Chacham talks about uh, a random halacha. En maftirin achar Pesach atikoman. Are we not supposed to say the story? And if it is the story, which is what we actually do, when was it from the Brit Ben Abitarim, from the covenant, from Briat Olam, from the whole reason why we're actually supposed to have this, where was the creation of the world? What is the end of a story? Is it from when we came out of Egypt? Is it Kriyat Yam Suf when, you know, the Jews were kind of finally happy that it was all over? Is it when we stood at Matan Torah, which is the point of the Yad Shrine? Is it going to Israel and getting the Bet Midash, like we say in Dayenu? 
And we spoke about the four expressions of the Geula, the Veheveti, the fight, the fifth cup, which um, represents the Bet Midash going back once the Yonavi will come bring Mashiach. And finally, we asked, what is this obligation of Hesheba, which we're supposed to express this freedom in a certain format, namely of reclining? Why in such an uncomfortable format, even though back in the day it was done by very specific individuals, you would think if we're all supposed to feel this, let's do something, an expression of freedom, which we all feel right about. Why do it in such an uncomfortable manner? We'll stop there, Mr. Hashem. Continue next week. Okay, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi. Good night.